Psalm 26, let's begin in the first verse. I've entitled the message, Walking in Integrity. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the inhabitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine in integrity, Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place. Even in the congregations will I bless the Lord. John Calvin, the great reformer, once said, No greater energy, uh, no greater injury can be inflicted upon men than to wound their reputation. Charles Spurgeon said of Psalms 26, David, the sweet singer of Israel, was the type of the great son of David and is an encouraging example to us to carry the burden of slander to the throne of grace. Those who live godly lives can expect to receive a persecution in this fallen world. Often this occurs in the form of a verbal attack by unbelievers. When attacked, believers must be certain that the persecution comes because of their commitment to the Lord and not because of some personal flaw. Such was the experience of David as he reigned as the king of Israel. False charges called into question his ability to lead the nation, challenging his spiritual fitness to approach God in the tabernacle. What is worse? By the way, where was the tabernacle at this time? It was at Shiloh. They moved it from Shiloh to Jerusalem in the dedication of the temple. Solomon had all of the implements of the holy place, the candlestick, the golden altar of incense, the tables of showbread, and they'd of course made a lot more tables. They didn't have just one. They had one for each tribe. And they brought it into the holy place, but there was one thing that wasn't in Shiloh. It was part of the tabernacle. What was it? The Ark of the Covenant. Because it had been separated when Enoch's sons took the Ark of the Covenant into battle with the Philistines. The Philistines had captured it some many years before and had moved from different spots until finally David took it to Jerusalem and built a tent over it. But all the rest of the tabernacle was a shallow. But what is worse, these charges against David were brought by deceitful men and hypocrites, and they were bloodthirsty, seeking his abdication and death. They would stop at nothing, even resorting to bribery to bring about the king's downfall. The the goal, 
their goal was to destroy David and bring him down. In the face of such personal, personal attacks, David went to the house of God in verses 4 through 6 to focus on the glory of God in verse 8 and to appeal for God's defense. This Psalm of David is the first of three Psalms, Psalm 26, 27, and 28, which centers on David's appearing in the house of the Lord to admire God's glory. Last week in Psalm 25, David confessed his sins, and David was a great sinner. But in this psalm, David talks about his righteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but I have perfect righteousness. But, you see, it's not Terry Leach's. 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. I'm set up. I'm sanctified. That just means you're set apart. I'm righteous because I've been clothed with the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ. I have wisdom because the Holy Spirit can give me spiritual, and does give me spiritual discernment. You see, Christ has made us and made unto me righteousness as well as redemption. This is on the plus side of the ledger, and I stand complete in him, accepted in the beloved. That's what it means to pray in his name. It is to present his work, his merit, and who he is with our request. First of all, we have a prayer of vindication in verses 1 and 2. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. This is a marvelous psalm that speaks of David's walk. David committed a great sin, but David did not continue to sin and to live in the sin. In contrast, we see the lost man in Deuteronomy 32.5, their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Steve, you asked me a while back where we could find that sermon, Sin Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, that's the text here. Did you ever find it? Well, you should have mentioned it. I, I would have printed it up. You can get it on the Internet. Just... Just type in sinners in the hands of an angry God on uh, Google, and it'll probably give you the whole sermon. What David did once was Bathsheba. The king of Babylon did every day. The Pharaoh in Egypt sinned every day. David's sin stands out like a lump of coal in a snowman. Because the rest of David's life was an example of godliness. He, he, did, he didn't say that he was sinless. But as far as we know, David really stepped out of line one bad time in his life. And he became a measuring stick. The example for the kings who followed him. Every king was judged by whether or not he walked in the steps of his father David. If he followed David's example, he was accepted and proclaimed a good king. And this psalm reminds us of this first psalm, of the first psalm. Notice how it reads, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. It was because of his faith in the Lord that David did not slide. Not that he was so strong, that he was per perfect, perfect, and he knew he wasn't. But he knew that when he trusted the Lord, the Lord would sustain him. And not only was this David's prayer of vindication, but a prayer for examination. Verses 3 through 8, and we're going to start with verse 3 through 5. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. 
I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. This psalm is similar to Psalm 1. David says, I have walked in thy truth. This is a positive statement. Psalm 1, verse 1, presents the negative side. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Furthermore, David sta states that he has not sat with vain persons nor with dissemblers. David did not sit with false per uh, persons. As Psalm 1 put it, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. A companion passage to this would be Thessalonians 5, 22-24. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. As an old farmer used to say, if you lay down with dogs, you'll get up with fleas. And that's what David's saying here in this song. He said, I'm not going to sit down with vain people and go with the dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. He didn't want to be tainted. If you make your friends and the people that you fellowship with are wicked people, whether you do what they do or not, people are going to think you do. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And then in the sixth verse, I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. A man's faith needs to be backed up with a good life. How important this psalm is in this connection. Maybe the reason for this section of psalms is not so popular today is because they emphasize a life that is pleasing to God. Now, verse 7 and 8. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. In contrast to his rejection of sinners, David stated that he loved the house of the Lord where God's people gathered to worship. He washed his hands in innocence before the altar the place where God's people came to exalt the Lord's name. His greatest delight in worshiping God was proclaiming aloud God's praise in the place where the Lord's glory dwells. God's glory was a revelation of his divine attributes and perfections to these worshipers. And not only was this David's prayer of vindication and examination, but it was a prayer for salvation. Verses 9 through 11, beginning in verses 9 and 10. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. With one hand, they give out their rewards, in the other hand, they're paying for your obedience to their commands. Kind of like uh, Putin. On one hand, he's saying, now I want to negotiate. But it's got to be in a country that I'm in control of. On one hand, he offers Negotiation, on the other hand, he's got an iron fist. We should have had prayer for those people in that country today. It's a sad thing. 
when Saddam Hussein tried to conquer a little country because of its oil. And our first president, Bush, said it would not stand. And we came in and we pushed him back across the border. Bush said in order to get the agreement of the world so that the world would be against Saddam, he had to agree not to conquer Iraq. And when our troops met the opposition on the deserts, they found that they were just bombs they picked up off the street and gave give a uniform to. Saddam Hussein had 400,000 in his army, third largest in the world, fourth. But he wasn't willing for his National Guard to get hurt, so he just put out the bombs. People they could find on the street. And we went through those people like the cannon fodder. They just give up. And we go on. And we could have pushed into Baghdad and saved ourselves the whole war that followed that George Bush II had to deal with and the country had to deal with later. But Bush said no. I gave my word. He had integrity. Now, I don't agree with what everything that he did. I don't agree what he, with everything his son did, but the alternative was certainly a whole lot worse. I don't agree with everything that Trump did. Maybe one of the things I didn't like was the way he dealt with people very roughly and the way he went about things. But I sure agreed with the success and the basic principles of what he was trying to do. But I also know that you have peace through strength. And Ronald Reagan had that down. And Trump had that down. We would not be facing the problems in the world today with a potential World War III had Trump been elected. I'm confident of that. But he wasn't. And we have to deal with a very weak president. And the world sees it. And China and Russia has been laying back licking their chops. And they knew that they had control when we gave away Afghanistan, the way we gave it away. And so we're going to have to deal with the consequences of the last election, presidential election. <coughs> and somebody says, well, I wish he'd just resign. <clears throat> well, that'd be like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. How would you like to deal with the vice president. So maybe she would resign. Well, that's jumping into more fire because you've got Pelosi to deal with, and she's far worse than any of the other two. They, David prays for salvation. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. Finally, David prayed, asking God not to take away his life in the judgment of sinners, referring to the same men whom he had rejected. There were bloodthirsty men who sought to take his life. There were men full of bribes who sought to influence others to harm him. David pleaded for God to spare him from their condemnation. And then in verse 11, But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. In contrast to these sinners, David confessed, I lead a blameless life 
one of moral purity and integrity. He asked the Lord to redeem. That word in Hebrew is pata. It means to rescue. Rescue me from the false accusations and personal attacks of evil men. And not only was David's prayer of vindication and examination and salvation, but David's prayer was a prayer of confirmation. That last verse, My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. My foot standeth in an even place. That means that he was sure-footed now. He is established on the rock. The even place speaks of that. When you're on the side of a slippery hill, you're apt to fall. A lot of Christians are in that position today. They're playing with evil. They get close to it. It reminds me of a little boy in the pantry. His mother heard a noise in the back of the kitchen and asked, Willie, where are you? And little Willie said, I'm in the pantry. She said, what are you doing in there? He said, I'm fighting temptation. <laughs> well, that was not the place for Willie to fight temptation. Many Christians flirt with sin. Years ago, J. Vernon McGee received a letter from one of the radio listeners to his radio broadcast who wanted counsel. And she wrote about how her husband had died and a close friend of her husband became the one to handle the estate. It was necessary for her to meet with him often and before long, as she put it, the chemistry between them began to react and they began to care for each other despite the fact that this man was married. She felt uneasy about the situation and asked what she could do. And Dr. McGee replied, You are in a burning building. Jump out as quickly as you can. He advised her to leave that town and relocate. Later, he received another letter from her. It said after a couple of weeks of rationalizing, she had followed his suggestion and moved to another town. Looking back on it, she said, I know I would have fallen into sin if I'd stayed there. So friends, it is well to have your feet on even ground. Where are you standing today? Tonight. The reason a great many people fall is because they're fighting temptation in the pantry. So close to sin. So close to enticement. So close to the devil dangling his bangles and paste jewels. The importance of a living a life of personal integrity cannot be overstated. A believer's life should always be lived as in the presence of God, as under his divine scrutiny. And after all, that's exactly what we do. We're living in the presence of God. God sees everything. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. And somehow people think that they're hiding their sins from God. Not only can't you hide from God's searching eye, but God knew about it before he ever created you in the first place. And despite all the mounting, black, dirty, filthy sins of this world, he still sent his son to die on the cross. Now that's love. Only by living as before the Lord can a person live without hypocrisy and duplicity. There must be a consistency between a person's convictions and his character. What would such a divine investigation of your life reveal? Well, Brother Leach, if I knew that God was just looking over my shoulder and seeing every thought that I had and every little thing that I'd done and the wickedness and all that, well, I wouldn't do it. Well, he is looking. 
What would such a divine investigation of your life reveal? Could most Christians invite such a thorough examination of their lives before the Lord? David could. And so must Christians today. Perhaps many need to change their ways or restore some part of their life to full integrity. May the study of this psalm be a time of personal restoration to holiness. When facing difficulties and troubling circumstances, the believer should focus on the glory of God. Corporate worship with like-minded believers is a source of strength for the troubled soul. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, which the manner of some is. No great and no greater inner fortitude exists than loving and longing for the glory of God. That's what we need to be striving for. That's what we need to think about. That should be our motivation. Are we living for the glory of God? Or are we living for our pride? Or are we living for what the world has to think about us and what we do? Are we looking at it selfishly because we want to make sure that this is right for the mother or the father, this is right for the kids? It's not a question of that. It's whether it's right in the eyes of God. That's what's important. Well, that's the message this evening. So, uh, Steve, would you close us in prayer and we'll go right into our business meeting.